Welcome. Welcome to Kaplan Medical's M4 panel. Uh, I'm Mark Ratliff, Senior uh, USMLE Advisor here at Kaplan Medical, here to uh, introduce to you three wonderful students uh, who are uh, current M4s, who are going to talk to you a little bit about specialties, how they chose their specialty, um, the decisions that they made that led them to their specialty, some, some changes of heart, and um, considering about the considerations about the future. Uh, so uh, without further ado, we're going to bring them along. Um, let me get control of my screen here. All right, so we have with us tonight, Tara, uh, who is uh, at an osteopathic school in Florida. Hi, Tara. Hi. Anthony. <laughs> Anthony is at an allopathic, allopathic school in California. Hey, Anthony. Hey, everyone. All right. And, um, whoops, one more. Dory uh, is at an allopathic school in South Carolina. Hello. Hi, Dory. All right, so that's uh, our, our panel tonight. Uh, before we uh, get into the first question, um, Tara, uh, Anthony, Dory, are you, are you excited to, uh, to chat to some uh, fellow med students tonight? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Looking yeah. forward to right. all the virtualness of this. Right, you know, um, right now more than ever, we need to connect with each other and if it's through virtual ways, then that's what, how it's gonna be. So please, everybody in the audience uh, today, tonight, uh, depending on where you are, uh, please submit questions into the chat. Um, they're going to be funneled up to us at the end of the session and we're gonna to try to address as many questions as we can. We've got nine of our own that we're going to address with the panel. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to call on Dory and talk whoops sorry dory i got a runaway mouse <laughs> sorry <You're folks>. fine. <laughs> ah there we go dory did you get into medical school assuming one specialty was for you and did that change absolutely that's a fabulous question so for me i actually came to medical school thinking i was going to go into OBGYN. Um, i love women's health i love surgery um, and I figured that was a good fit of both. Um, they also, OBGYN does a great job of also implementing a lot of medicine. So I thought it was kind of a good mix of everything. Um, for me, that did change. And I will go into kind of more later about how that changed. But um, I started looking at other factors such as like lifestyle, um, what I wanted as far as patient population, whether I wanted to treat men, women, and children, um, and then also looking just at what procedures I wanted, whether I wanted procedures or not. Um, so for me, I kind of went in with a narrow mindset and very quickly on in third year realized that it was better to look at everything from like an open mind and approach each rotation with kind of eyes wide open and ready to ready to learn. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tara, tell us a little bit about your um, experience of, of choosing your specialty. So yeah, so I ended up, um, I'm going to be applying for family medicine this year. And I actually started medical school thinking that I wanted to do emergency medicine, which is super popular right now. Um, and so I changed my mind and I'm going to go into it a little bit more um, as we move along. But definitely when you're doing rotations and you're working with doctors and because on your rotations, you're expected to do basically, you know, three months of internal and a month of family, and you do all these rotations, um, you get to see different aspects of different fields of medicine from different sides. So um, that's why I kind of switched from emergency to family med. Um, but if you had told me that I was going to switch when I started medical school, I would have told you no, like, I'm so sure. Um, and obviously, I wasn't so sure. So it's definitely okay to switch and change your mind. No doubt. Uh, Anthony, you have a little experience with that yourself. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, going into medical school, um, I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, I thought it was pretty, um, not fully set, but pretty set. A lot of the work that I did prior to medical schools with kids, like in summer camps and things like that. Um, and I very quickly realized that I actually really enjoyed working with adults as well. Um, and I'll be talking about that a lot as the, the panel goes on. Um, and so I'm instead applying into med peds, which um, allows me to have kind of the best of both worlds. Um, but echoing what Tara and Dory said, it's, um, it's up to you. you. It can change, it cannot change. Just going into third year with the biggest 
uh, open mindset that you can is the best thing for learning. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, it, you never know what's going to happen. And then there's the match and then there's, uh, you know, the considerations of um, competitiveness and your scores. There's so many things that go into it. All right. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I can't get the slides to go. There we go. All right. So um, let's talk with uh, Dory. Tell us about what factors were important to you when you chose your specialty. Absolutely. And I apologize. I should have said earlier, I'll be applying in anesthesia. So for me, that was a really hard choice. Um, I actually ended up flipping a coin, which <laughs> is a whole different thing. But I actually kind of recommend it if you're kind of between two specialties and you've done a ton of research. Um, kind of flipping a coin gives your mind like a chance to figure out like whether you would have been satisfied with what it landed on or not. So for me, it actually really helped me um, cause decide between OBGYN and anesthesia. But prior to that coin flip, I had done a ton of research. I had talked to a ton of faculty in both specialties. Um, I listened to a ton of podcasts just truly because I was torn and paralyzed by not making a decision. So factors when I was looking at those two decisions for me um, was first off like lifestyle. So shift work or not shift work. Um, I decided ended up choosing like I like shift work a lot. Um, and I like that very like that strict schedule and knowing when I will be at work and when I won't. But that's definitely not for everyone. I like call. Um, I've really enjoyed my overnights in the hospital. So that was something to take in consideration. Um, patient population, huge, huge thing. Um, for me, what made me choose anesthesia over OBGYN ultimately was the fact that I didn't want to cut out uh, men and children. Um, and I liked the aspect that I could see everyone and still get a lot of medicine and anesthesia and procedures. Um, and then for me, that was the other deciding factor was kind of Number one, could I give up surgery? Because I loved surgery. Um, but ultimately, I decided that I could because I am very okay. Procedures kind of fill that fill that void for me. Um, and it took me a long time to choose. Nearly the end of my third year, um, I was kind of coming down to the wire when I made that choice. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone to ask questions, kind of keep notes throughout your rotation about what you liked, what you didn't like, um, especially even when it comes to like, uh, the kinds of people that you work with. I feel like that can sometimes really impact your view on certain specialties, but definitely look beyond just your rotations because like, let's say a pediatrics program at my school might be completely different from one at yours, Tara. So it's like very important that you kind of look beyond just your program to see kind of what the personality and kind of what the lifestyle and also like what sorts of avenues you can have, whether that's inpatient or outpatient. Um, options that you have in different different areas of the world if that makes sense it totally does uh anthony uh can you tell us a little bit about uh how how what other factors went into choosing your specialty uh yeah definitely um i was very torn in this i actually made the decision like maybe a month ago um so it's all pretty fresh in my mind um but going into third year um a big decision that they tell you about is like choosing if you want to do a surgical subspecialty or a medicine uh, field. Um, for me, I knew that it was, uh, I, I wanted to lean towards the medicine way. So it came down to deciding what age I wanted to work with, as well as um, in what setting, in an inpatient or an outpatient setting. Um, and I realized going throughout the 12 months of third year that I really couldn't give up any of it. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed um, treating both kids and adults. And I really both enjoyed treating both outpatient and inpatient for all of them. Um, and so that really left only two things, family medicine and, and med peds. Um, and I'll leave the family medicine to Tara because she's going to go into that. Um, but med peds is a relatively, uh, it's, it's kind of an older field actually, um, but it's resurfacing now. And essentially what it is, is it gives you training for all of inpatient, outpatient, uh, pediatrics and adults, but it's shifted a little bit more of a focus towards inpatient in, manage in management of adults and kids. Um, and so um, I realized that I was really intellectually stimulated being in the hospital inpatient setting, um, being able to work with other attendings, consult them, uh, being able to teach residents constantly, teach medical students constantly. Um, 
And that pushed me more towards the med ped side of things and towards the family side of things. Um, and also um, another thing that helped me choose med peds is that um, they train you more in your four years there in um, inpatient pediatrics, like ICU pediatrics, um, which is also, I wanted to uh, like firm training in that as well. Um, so that is the long-winded explanation as to why med peds. Not at all, not at all. It seems like uh, once thing, once you get into it, once you start really having personal experiences, that's when things can either confirm what you were thinking or, you know, other things seem to be like more exciting than maybe you had thought. Tara, tell us a little bit about how long it took you to choose your specialty, as uh, Anthony alluded to. So like I said, I was thinking I wanted to do emergency med. And at my school, we don't do an EM rotation until fourth year. So I haven't even done an EM rotation, but we get electives. So you could choose to do it for one of your electives. But I would say I knew about three or four rotations in because you start to notice a trend. Like, for example, on my pediatrics rotation, the first two weeks, I was so excited. Like I, I, I was loving every second of it. You're seeing like different ages of kids, you're learning. Um, and by the last two weeks, I was just kind of bored. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm done seeing children. I'm done seeing like the same sniffles. You know, some of the stuff like, you know, interesting patients were still coming in that were different, but it became very run of the mill. And then the same thing happened on my ob rotation. The first two weeks I was like, oh my God, like these pregnant bellies. I was asking all these women if I could touch their bellies. I was measuring them, all the things. And then the last two weeks I was just kind of like, okay, like I get it. Like, you know, or they're coming in with gyne issues or, you know, it just kind of becomes the same thing. So I started realizing as I was doing these rotations, like I'm really excited the first two, three, two, three weeks. And then by the end of it, I'm just burnt out and I want this to be over. And that's what kind of made me realize like, I don't want to just pigeonhole into one, you know, specialty. I don't want to be a specialist. Um, I want to basically be in charge of everything. You know, if I'm managing someone's thyroid and then the next patient I'm doing psych and the next patient I'm, you know, doing a kid's well visit and the next patient I'm doing a sports med physical, like that's exciting to me. I don't, you know, know what's going to be coming in next kind of thing. And that was a little bit of the EM in me, but you know, what I liked about the family medicine too is like, I want to be a community doctor. You know, I, I went to medical school. I learned all of this knowledge. And, you know, they say it's such a cliche answer, like, oh, you just want to help people. But that's really what it is at the core of it. And that's what family medicine is. Um, you know, we have the most power to be able to change patients' lives, to be able to follow the trajectory of a patient from birth to death. Um, and that's what I found that I, I, I want. That's what fulfills me. That's what would make all of these years of schooling worth it. And so that's also why I shifted from EM because, you know, while I, I agree with Dory, I love shift work and it's great. In some ways, you know, I realized I, I would be missing some of that connection and continuity. Um, so, you know, I figured out about four months into the rotation, um, into rotations, but it was hard. It's hard when you're like, so mentally, like I'm doing this, you know, I, I was telling people I was doing EM. And so it's kind of that pride thing, you know, like where you're like, I've told everyone that I'm doing this, but um, I'm really happy that I settled into family medicine. And they have a saying in family medicine, because a lot of people end up picking family medicine, even towards the end of third year. And they're like, you know, we don't care when you picked family. We're just happy that you found us. We're happy that you chose family. So um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with my choice, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. kind of the trajectory of it. Yeah. I've had two doctors my whole life. Like, you know, I had one when I was a kid and then, then I've had the same doctor since I've been 16 or now 18. Yeah. Crazy. I'm not telling you how old I am. Um, all right, let's get moving. All right. Question three is for Dory. Uh, what are the highlights and challenges of uh, anesthesiology? In your mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I am not an anesthesiologist, just a medical student answering this question, yeah, but from so the outside perspective, um, I think some of the highlights would be, um, I think this could be a highlight and a challenge, honestly, swinging from very low acuity to very high acuity at a very quick rate. Um, there are going to be some cases where everything goes perfectly, and there will be some cases where things happen to patients or things happen during a surgery that no one would have anticipated. Um, so I think being able to switch from that like low acuity, kind of a mundane, normal day to like very high acuity lives could be on the line. Um, I think that's both a highlight and a challenge for me. That is something I like. Um, 
I like being under pressure. Um, and I think that that's both a highlight and a challenge. I think that if you don't like being under pressure and you kind of don't like those huge pendulum shifts, maybe um, a field like anesthesia might not be for you. Um, but I think that that's one big one. I think skills wise, I think procedure, procedure wise, I think you probably need to be pretty good with your hands um, and also enjoy doing procedural work, enjoy doing kind of the same procedures day in, day out and becoming an expert at those. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much from the outside looking in the big ones. Uh, Tara, talk about family and uh, some of the challenges of the family. And so, skills. So kind of what I highlighted for family, you have to be able to manage, um, it's a lot of chronic conditions. So you will have patients that come in with some acuity, like a, a, you know, acute gout or something like that. Um, but most of it is going to be chronic. So you're chronic, like, I mean, you're managing patients who have, you know, coronary artery disease or diabetes, and they've had it for 20, 30 years. So that can become a little bit um, challenging in the sense that, you know, patients have habits and you can tell them some lifestyle changes or tell them things that they can do to um, help their hypertension, which is high blood pressure or help their high cholesterol or, you know, all those things. But um, that's one thing that kind of drew me away from family initially, because it it's, it's difficult. I mean, you're seeing patients for all this time and you're trying to help them and, you know, it's hard to break people's habits. Um, so that's definitely a challenge of the specialty. Um, and then as far as like uh, a skill or like a highlight of it, a lot of people don't realize family medicine, like I said, my scope is everything. So yes, traditionally family medicine physicians are outpatient, but especially with shortage of physicians, a lot of family medicine physicians become hospitalists. So they're doing inpatient medicine. They're doing critical care ICU work, especially in rural places like Oklahoma. Um, and they basically, everything is in your scope. So if you like procedures, you can get additional training and you can do dermatology procedures. If you like women's health, you can do gyne, you can do colposcopies. You can even follow patients during their pregnancy. And if you get the training, you can deliver babies. So that's the greatest thing about family because when people say like, oh, well, that's not in your scope of practice. Well, in family, everything is your scope of practice. So it's great. You get to tailor your, 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 your outpatient office or tailor your career basically to what you wanna do. It's definitely a good specialty for the curious mind. Like obviously your doctors, so every specialty is every doctor has to have a curious mind to even get started. But there's the, the curious of the curious. And so it, somebody who wants to learn a lot about everything is it's a good spot. Uh, Dory, before Anthony, we're gonna jump to you. Dory, uh, you had something else you wanted to add? Yes, Tara made me think of it. And I'm so sorry I didn't mention it earlier. Uh, a challenge for my field would be um, probably most likely most of my patients won't think of me as their doctor. They will think of Tara as their doctor. They will think of Anthony as their doctor and they will not think of me as their doctor. And so like, that's a huge thing to be able to realize that and be okay with it. And I am very okay with that. But I think that that's something that anyone who's interested in this field in anesthesia or something that's similar to that might need to think about going into it. Thank you. That's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And, and that could be, a you know, depending on your personality, that could mm -hmm. be perfect. You know, like that could be exactly what you want. Uh, Anthony, tell us a little bit about yours because uh, you talked a little bit about it earlier, but uh, talk about some challenges to, to dealing with both adults and kids. Yeah. So um, I'll start a little bit with the highlights, then I'll dive into the challenges. Um, I think um, echoing a lot of what was said, it's, it's all about the breadth of what you can do. Um, with, uh, with MedPeds. And I think that that's the most amazing aspect of it, in my opinion. Um, on the MedPeds website, they actually have a quote from Hannah Montana, where she says, best of both worlds. I literally think it's the best of like all four worlds, peds, adults, inpatient, outpatient. You can do anything that you, your heart desires with it, really. Um, I think with that comes a bit of a challenge, though, um, because something that a lot of people say when you say, oh, I'm going into MedPeds or a lot of MedPeds physicians end up doing is they end up picking one. They end up picking, sticking towards the outpatient setting and treating both kids and adults, or they end up saying, okay, I just wanna work in the hospital and treat um, just adults. Um, and I think that that's a bit of a challenge because it is more on you to take the initiative to be able to keep your foot in all the doors that you wanna be, that, that you wanna be part of. Um, and, 
as as far as the med peds physicians that I look up to the most, it's the the ones who are able to run around all day from doing a half day of clinic with in a, in a, a pediatric clinic to a half day in an adult's clinic, and then rounding on their patients in the hospital. Um, and I think that's the the best thing of it because it keeps all the information that you've learned fresh in your mind, and it requires you to do so. Um, because you don't know what's going to walk in your door, like in the outpatient setting, like Tara was setting, like you don't have the chance to like walk out and like Google something really quickly. You have to be able to know how to counsel and, 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 and know um, what the appropriate medication to give is everything basically on the, on, on spot. Um, and I also, another aspect of MedPeds that I really enjoy is that they're often, MedPeds programs are often attached to academic centers. Um, which allows you to do research and teach basically as much as you want on top of your clinical responsibilities. Um, but yeah, that's why the highlights and challenges of MedPeds, I think. All right, excellent, excellent. Thank you guys very much. And everybody who's in the room tonight, um, obviously you can see some of you are probably in involved in some of these and maybe you hadn't considered them, but definitely let us know um, what your thoughts are. Okay. So you're in M4, so you've had some experience. Uh, Tara, you mentioned that you still have some experience to get. What specialty surprised you most? Anthony, uh, you just finished up, but I'd like you to, to lead off on this one for me. What specialty surprised you most? Um, I think the specialty that surprised me most would probably be um, ob um, because I didn't think that I would like it as much, but there's something very very captivating about being able to witness like life coming into the world. Um, I think that very rare things beat it. Um, and I think that the connections that you're able to make with mom and dad um, or the parents of, of the child are just insurmountable um, with being able to push with mom in the room and, um, and actually being able to deliver a baby. Um, I think that surprised me the, the most about it. That's awesome. But I did tend to um, want to go to the baby because when you when the baby is delivered, then they turn around, and they hand it to the pediatrics team. So I always tended to want to go over there. <laughs> um, but yeah, instinct kicked in. I've only I've only got the experience that once and it was it was my son. So I can I can attest to it being amazing. So being able to do that all day long comes pretty amazing. Uh, Tara, what about you? What specialty surprised you? So surprised in a good way, I'd say geriatrics. I don't think I've ever met a medical student who's like, I want to do geriatrics. This is my life's passion. Um, but when you start doing rotations, like it'll be integrated in family or I actually did it and they called it internal medicine for me um, because there are internal medicine geriatricians. Um, and so I was shocked that it surprised me in a good way how much I actually liked it. Um, and it can be mixed, it's geriatrics, and sometimes it's mixed with like hospice palliative care, because of course a lot of patients have terminal illness, um, so they are hospice patients. And so I worked in a lot of like nursing homes and skilled facilities, um, and you know, it depends on the facility that you're at, you'll see acuity, like there's facilities where they have patients on vents, so they have like the pulmonologist coming in and you're basically working with them because you're there on the day to day taking care of these patients and then you know the pulmonologist rounds you know a few times a week to see them. Um, but basically geriatrics for sure um, surprised me and in a good way and I just encourage everyone if going in medical school, there's a huge shortage of geriatricians. We need people who are interested in doing geriatric medicine. Um, so if you're even an inkling that you might think that you might like it, you can choose to do it. Ask your you know, hospital site or ask your uh, medical school if they have anywhere that they send people for geriatrics. It's definitely like a growing field. There's a shortage. Um, and it's, it's, it's the best of medicine and you're really helping people um, helping people who've lived a whole life. And there's a lot that, to gain from that. Um, and that that surprised me in a very positive way. And I mean, just think about all that COVID has been doing and, and will do to, to not just people who are suffering from it now, but the aftermath of people who have survived it. Um, people, uh, especially the elderly uh, suffering. So lots of, lots of opportunity. And then there's the whole baby boom generation is entering retiring age now. So like, you know, the population's facing that way. 
Uh, Dory, what about you? What had especially? So we've heard about good good surprises. I don't know if you're going to give us another good surprise or <laughs> maybe a horror story. I think I think we wouldn't mind hearing a horror story from one of you. So I'm sad to say I probably can't provide that. I loved everything third year, which was one of the reasons my choice was so hard, just because I loved everything. Um, something that surprised me in a very good way was family medicine, but specifically my rural rotation. I loved it. Um, so procedural, kind of like what Tara was talking about earlier. My attending her scope of practice was huge. Like in one patient's room, we'd be like cutting a tongue tie off a baby. And the next we'd be doing like a psychiatric consult. And then she'd be delivering babies on the weekend. Like it was insane. But like beyond that, it was not only was every day different and so fun, her patients really, you got to see kind of that old timey doctor patient relationship where they really, she knew all of her patients. She would ask about her patients' families. She would ask about her patients' pets. Um, it was just this beautiful relationship where they trusted her. She was a, an integral part of the community and is, and also just, you got to see like their, like that beautiful therapeutic relationship that we all strive for. Um, so I really, really loved that. It was a fabulous two weeks. It was an hour drive for me there and back. And I didn't mind it at all, just purely because I learned more in those two weeks than I think I did in any other rotation. So I absolutely adored it. Um, and I think we also had another question, um, just as a sidebar, uh, Kristen asked us to talk about choosing elective rotation. So I'll popcorn it over to Tara and Anthony after I say something about this. But for me, choosing elective rotations was just kind of all about like what I was interested in and also like what I thought I would never get to see. Um, so I think it's just pick something that you like. I don't think that you can choose incorrectly with your electives. They can really just broaden your learning and broaden what you get to see during third year. Um, if you have any interest in it, try to get an elective in it. Um, and if you think that you might dislike something, maybe go for that and kind of push yourself out of your comfort zone. So I would say maybe do something that you like and then maybe pick one that you think would challenge you more and you would grow from. Anthony? Uh, so the question was, uh, elect, how do you choose your uh, elective rotations as Dorian asked? Yeah, um, I'm going to have to echo a lot of what Dory said and try not to sound repetitive in it, but it really right. boils down to the two, those two things. What interests you the most and what do you think you'll never see again? Um, because once, you, um, once you're, say, pick internal medicine and you decide to go into internal medicine, you're probably not going to step foot in an OR again. Um, so if you really want it, to try something like a certain like a ortho surge or, or something like that, um, then definitely do an elective in that. Um, I think another valuable piece of that is um, challenging yourself in things that you aren't very great at. Um, so for me, like, for example, that would be the kidneys, um, like nephrology. So I have like a pediatrics nephrology elective coming up because I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to know this at some point. So I might as well just dive in into an opportunity where I can do that. Um, but electives, um, I maybe I'll say this here and maybe the person who asked the question can clarify um, the difference between sub eyes and electives um, because sub eyes are um, in the fields that you're usually in the fields that you're planning on applying into while electives are other can fill the rest of your fourth year schedule and sometimes your third year schedule as well. Um, so if there's a clarifying question on that we can get to that later. No, no problem. Uh, Tara, what about you? Uh, did you have any special um, reasoning behind how you chose? So I love, so I agree with Anthony and Dory's answer, but I'm going to give more of my like strategic advisor answer, um, especially with COVID rotations and electives and a lot of things this year, whether they're sub internships for those of us applying for match this year or just electives if you're a third year building your schedule, some of them are hard to come by. And I have colleagues who were banking on their last few months of third year rotations, which got cut off because of COVID to get some of their letters of rec. I have friends who are applying family medicine who've never done a family medicine rotation because COVID cut it short. So if you have electives, I would recommend, while I do agree, I want you to explore options. 
if there's a field that you think that you you know, are going to be applying, use that elective to work with a doctor who will benefit you, a doctor who will get you a good letter of recommendation, a doctor who's maybe affiliated with a program, um, a residency program that you think you'll be interested in applying to. Um, be strategic, you know, use it to make those connections, make that networking, um, because especially with COVID, a lot of things have been thrown to the, to the wind. Um, and I, I would say get your letters of recommendation and use your electives to get good letters um, because I have classmates. I mean, they, they took electives they thought would be interesting. I have a colleague who, you know, was thought hematology oncology would be interesting, you know, and even she at the time basically knew like I probably wouldn't, you know, I'm not doing internal medicine. I'm going to apply family and, you know, the chances of matching the hemonc fellowship are low and she took that elective and now, you know, she's applying family with no family letter of rec. So it's, you know, try to be strategic. It is about learning and enjoying your and getting an education. But, you know, there are some things that we still have to do in our third and fourth years to, to ensure that we match and to match where we want to match. So I would use my electives to get letters of recommendation. Great, 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 great. Good advice, everybody. You guys are hopefully uh, they're taking notes. <laughs> All right. Um, I asked the group earlier how to pronounce this. So I'm just going to go with my way as Eros. <laughs> Eros applications are going in soon. Uh, what do you think residency directors value most for your specialty? Um, and I think, uh, Tara, you had a comment. I remember you wanted to make sure everybody knew about the really good resource that's out there for them. Yeah, of course. So if you go, I think we're going to link it in the chat for you guys, um, but you can also just Google NRMP match data. They do a program director survey. They did it in 2018 at the end of the match, and they basically surveyed all the program directors for um, all of the specialties. It's not just family medicine. You can find anesthesiology on there. You can find pediatrics. You can find internal med. You can find all of them on there where they ask the program directors, what's most important to you? So I can speak to family medicine because I've looked at looked at the, the match data on that. They very much so care about your interview um, and they want to see that you're going to fit into their program. So they're judging you um, from the minute. Well, now I don't know because of COVID, so it's going to be virtual. But and essentially from the minute that you walk on their campus, right, how you interact with faculty, how you interact with residents, um, how do you interact with the program director? How do you interact with the other people who are interviewing at the same time as you? Um, and so they're really looking for that to see if they think you're going to fit in. You know, they're going to have to work with you for three to four years. They want to make sure that they're going to enjoy doing that. Um, and then as far as family medicine goes, commitment to the specialty, they care about that. They want to see that you want to be a family medicine doctor, not that you're just applying family medicine, you know, not just that you're applying family medicine because you're also applying surgery and you want to make sure you match something. You know, we, we want family docs who want to be family docs. Um, and so they're looking for that. Um, and you can go on there. There's a few more specifics, but I will say for family medicine, they are a little bit lower on the list at looking at board scores. They're more forgiving. Um, and if you have red flags on your application, you can explain those in your personal statement. Um, they're very understanding. They know that life happens, things happen. It's, you know, your board scores, it's one day. Um, and that's not the entirety of who you are as a person and who you're going to be as a physician. Um, so those are kind of a few of the things that they're looking at. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I know we shared the link to the NRMP uh, program director survey at a glance, uh, which is a nice little uh, series of graphs and things that you can you can take a look at. Um, but you can download the PDF document that really breaks it down by specialty. Um, and you write, um, there's two different ones, right? They ask, uh, how do you choose uh, who to interview? And how do you choose who to rank? And they use very different things <laughs> for those two things. They use your scores and your and your experience for interviews, and then it's all about you. Um, yeah, Anthony, um, what do you think about uh, your specialty? What do you think they're looking for beyond, um, you know, uh, a good interview? Yeah. What else? Um, so again, echoing what Tara said um, about NM NMRPs just a fantastic resource. Um, also paired with another resource that will also be um, sent, uh, called Frida um, as well. That gives you even more information for specific residency programs within the specialties that you're thinking of. Um, for MedPeed specifically, I'm talking to a few program directors and residents that have been all over the country. Um, it's very important to them to see your comments and your letters of recommendation um, because that really goes to show you or show the readers and, and, and the people that your programs that you're applying to 
like what kind of worker you are not in the sense of how smart you are but what like are you is it are, are can you get along with people well do you exhibit qualities of patient care that um are exemplary different things like that um it's not just like who gave the best like a uh, patient presentation came up with like a zebra diagnosis it's it's, it's very much like they're, you're going to be in that program for three to four years. They wanna know if you guys fit together well. Um, and so that's why I think that MedPeds um, de definitely focuses more on letters of recommendation and your comments from your third year and fourth year um, clerkships and, and sub eyes as well um, in order to kind of factor into that decision. Um, and that's why, um, again, with like my advisor hat, quote unquote, it's um, when you're picking your letters of recommendation, your letter of recommendation writers, it's really important to not just pick somebody whose name sounds prestigious, but to pick someone who has seen you work and has seen you at your best and has seen you exhibit the things that make you a good doctor and the doctor that you want to become so that they can talk about it. Wonderful points. Uh, Dory, do you have anything you'd like to add? Sure, definitely echo what Tara and Anthony have said. Um, that's all good advice for anesthesia as well. I think that specifically they look at your comments from medicine and surgery during your third year as two of the more important comments, but all of the comments are very, very looked at with well regard. Um, also, I would echo that Frida and, and MRP are invaluable, invaluable resources. I think for all specialties, really, the letters of recommendation, especially in the day and age that we're currently looking at and applying this year, um, I think letters are huge. And I think that um, kind of what Anthony was saying, finding letter writers who can evaluate you both clinically and personally is really important because I feel like that gets a better breadth of like, this is who this human is, not just like, this is what this medical student is um, in the clinic if they can speak about you outside of the clinic as well. Um, if you can find those physicians that you can kind of have that more personal relationship with, um, that's huge because that really differentiates you and also gives the program something to talk about you, talk about with you on your interview days. So I think that that's huge. And like they were saying, I think that there's definitely parts of it that are like screening to get applicants to the interview day. And then once you're at the interview day, it's really more about seeing if you're a good fit for the program, what kind of person you are, like if you're going to actually get along with these people for the next set bit of time, several years at, at the very least. Um, so I think that those are all very important things. Great points, great points. You know, I, I'd like to add one thing. I worked um, with a lot of students uh, throughout the years matching to residency. And one of my best friends from my life uh, was a chief resident at UMass and now he's He's work, working in practice in Chicago. And he told me that, that your application has to be good enough every step it, up to the last, up to the personal statement. He said a lot of times they would just have a stack of personal, st stack of personal statements where people are like, all of these people are good. Pick 70 of them, you know, and they had to read all the personal. So everything came down to that thing, even though everything else was, you know, equal. For getting the interview so you really have to have a professional put together application i think that's another thing that's really key okay um let's keep going oh i had it figured out there we go all right so um dory let's start with you well, let's go back the other way uh, how many years is your specialty and do you plan on pursuing a fellowship so anesthesia is four and I am planning on pursuing a fellowship and doing obstetric, obstetric anesthesia, if at all possible, to bring back my, my love of OB. There you go. Tara? So family medicine is traditionally three years. There are some programs out there that are four. Um, and then as far as a fellowship, uh, I need to see where life takes me. Um, it's hard to commit because, you know, I, I want school to be over. I want to get a job. I want to get married. I want to have children. I want to live a different life than my academic life. Um, but if I did pursue a fellowship, there's pain management. You can do that from family medicine. Um, and that's something that I'm interested in, as well as geriatrics, which I mentioned earlier, or hospice and palliative care. So those are all options after family medicine. Anthony. 
Um, so med peds is four years long. Um, it takes a three year peds program and a three year med, uh, three year medicine program and combines it into one four year program, um, which is good because it offers you literally every single fellowship opportunity that you would want in either um, adult or pediatric medicine. Um, and also the newer fellowships that are coming along now that allow you to combine um, an adult cardiology fellowship and a pediatric cardiology fellowship into one. Um, there's a lot of different options that MedPeds has. Um, as of right now, I'm not sure what I want to do. Um, so I'm gonna leave that up to residency to kind of explore further. Um, but yeah, med MedPeds is uh, four years long. Um, I wanted to mention um, one thing in particular about the Frida website um, that I was mentioning earlier, um, that it also does have um, the information on board scores as well. Um, and as someone who is just going through all of this and trying to make my program list, um, the quote unquote cut off scores that programs have are much lower than you, you think that it would be um, because all schools and all specialties in general are shifting more towards a holistic approach in evaluating their applicants, I would say. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and we have the test change coming up too where, where you know, pass fail for step one, it's going to have to eventually be step two as well in the future because otherwise step two is just going to become step one and that same pressure will just get moved a year. Uh, so hopefully the people who are, uh, pay, who are attending this, um, you know, they're ready. All right, let's move along. Um, okay, so this one's straightforward. Um, we want to know, you know, you've, you three have had some success so far moving forward. What organizations or societies do you suggest getting involved with that you were a part of? And if you want anything that you wish you had, like, oh, wow, I wish I had started with this one earlier or something like that. Whoever would like to begin. Um, let's go with Anthony. I'm just kind of going back and forth. Um, so my big thing in the beginning of medical school um, was that I didn't want to be doing activities or research and things like that, that I wasn't truly passionate about. Um, and that's kind of what I went on, uh, went off of as I was picking the activities that I wanted to do. Luckily, I'm applying into MedPed, so that basically leaves, I could have done whatever that I wanted to do and it would have fallen under that. Um, but you don't necessarily to even have to do something specific to what you're applying into. So you don't have to specifically, for example, do anesthesiology research to apply to anesthesiology programs. Um, but for me, I was like, I would rather pick something that I can talk passionately and extensively about in an interview, um, rather than pick something that may look good on paper, um, but I, I, I don't feel the ties to it. Um, in addition to that, um, oh, so I, adding on to that, find your, the passions that you have. For example, I have a passion for education. So a lot of the activities that I have um, are centered around that, whether that be educating in the community, in communities about, uh, and trying to um, like ameliorate healthcare disparities or just teaching in a, as a TA in, in your school. Find whatever you're passionate about and stick to that theme, I would say. Um, Another thing that's extremely helpful is that every specialty that is out there has national programs um, and national program websites that you can sign up for um, that will send you information, link you information, link you cool articles, clinical pearls, different things like that. And it's always good to put your foot in the door. Um, you can even have the opportunity to go to specialties yearly conferences just to walk around and observe or if you're working in a lab in that specialty, even presenting something on it in a poster presentation or podium presentation. Um, so yeah, this, those, those two things, doing things that you're passionate about and um, getting involved in um, the national societies that um, are linked to your student interest groups. Great. Um, Tara. 
So basically exactly what Anthony said. So I can speak specifically to family, the American Academy of Family Physicians. They actually just this past weekend had a virtual conference. They hold their national conference every year in Kansas City and they went virtual and it was amazing. I got to speak to program directors, email them, talk to residents, Zoom with them, talk to them on the phone. Um, and I actually got a virtual sub internship opportunity from attending that. So it's super important to get involved as soon as you know what specialty you're interested in. Um, you know, prior to this year, I was thinking EM, so emergency med. So I had joined the American College of Emergency Physicians and EMRA, which is their residence organization. And I attended a conference in Michigan that they had had. Um, and, you know, on a rotation, I worked with a gastroenterologist. She took me to the annual gastroenterology meeting that they have. So, you know, there's always meetings going around. There's medical conferences. There's all kinds of things. So there's tons of opportunities to learn. And the main thing with a lot of these opportunities is, you know, again, the networking. Medicine is a very small world. Um, you know, and when I say medicine, I mean, literally just medicine in general, it's a small world, regardless of specialty. And you'd be shocked, like who knows who, and we're all almost, you know, five or six people removed. So it's super important to go to these meetings and not just learn, but make the connections that can make a difference. Um, you know, especially with the cycle that's going on now um, with COVID, I, I don't know how certain things are gonna pan out, but you know, you might have to call on a connection. If you went to a conference and you remember a program director that you, you know, ran into in the hallway and you remember their name, you can email and say, hey, I remember meeting you at the national conference for, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like I said, that's that perceived com commitment. Um, you know, if you bother to go to these meetings, it shows that you are dedicated and, you know, you're willing to take a weekend to do it and it's something that's important to you. Um, so I definitely say join the national organizations. Um, schools have clubs, like my school had tons of like little clubs and I joined most of them because they give you food, you know, you go to the meeting and you get dinner out of it. So I recommend, you know, yes, join your family medicine club at your school, but join the national club. The national club is the one that's gonna send you the stuff that you're gonna need. They're gonna send you the magazines with information. They're gonna send you um, the big conferences. That's, that's what you really need. And that's what you need to get out of this. And then another point Anthony made, like being passionate. Um, if your school has like the medical mission clubs, do that. Global health is super important, especially in family medicine. A lot of family medicine programs, they focus on global health and they have global health fellowships. I went on a mission trip between my first and second year of medical school uh, for two weeks in Greece. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, and I treated refugees that are in Greece. Um, and I think that it just gives you perspective um, I had a program director tell me that she looks for three things when she's looking at applicants. She wants applicants who are hungry, humble, and kind. Um, and hungry, she means hungry for knowledge. You know, humble, they, they know when they can say, I don't know, they need help. And kind, you just want nice people. Um, and teasing it out in some of these, you know, going to these conferences, going on a mission trip, it kind of helps you develop like who you want to be as a physician. Um, and it helps you kind of have experiences that back that up. So those are really important things to think about. Great. Uh, Dory, can you tell us a little bit about your specialty and if uh, what your plans are? Yeah, absolutely. So 100% echo what Tara and Anthony said. I think that picking something that you're passionate about at the beginning of medical school and kind of continuing that on throughout medical school is very important because that shows that you are dedicated to something and that it's it's also something you'll definitely talk about on your interview day. Um, and that could be something like a medical gardening club that uh, provides food to the community, or it can be national advocacy and policy work. Like it doesn't matter as long as it's something you're passionate about and something that you've actually dedicated time, which of which you have very little uh, to the betterment of like your community or your state or the nation. Uh, for me personally, I was really involved in student government in college and I loved the changes I was able to make on my college campus. So I knew going into medical school that I wanted to be involved in organized medicine. So I got involved with my local medical association, my state, and then I'm really involved with the AMA as well. Um, so I've been involved with those organizations all four years. I'm in leadership in all of them. I um, have loved being able to advocate for my patients and my colleagues at the national and state level. Um, for me, that's been one of the most valuable parts of medical school. I've gotten to meet medical students, kind of like what Tara and Anthony were saying, medical students from across the country. I've gotten to meet attendings from across the country. And all of these people are devoting all of their free time to helping make medicine a better place for everyone. Um, so I've really enjoyed that experience. But it really doesn't matter what you do as long as you're passionate about it. 
That's awesome. I should plug AMA. Uh, you mentioned AMA, partner of Kaplan. Uh, if you're an AMA member, you get 30% discount on top of a, on top of already discounted courses. So it pays for itself if you're going to uh, consider using Kaplan. All right. So our last three questions, a little bit rapid fire. Um, you know, uh, let's do about 30 seconds. Um, 30 seconds per answer if you can. Not that we don't want to hear from you, but we want to get to all the questions. Um, here, let's go. And so I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go around the room as I see you. So Tara, Anthony, Dory, in that order. What organizations or societies do you suggest getting involved with? We kind of answered this one a little bit, but Tara, do you have anything additional you'd like to add? Oh, you're on mute. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, okay. No, I think I, I think I spoke to. I think we we kind of just went over that one, but I would just echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it, it was hidden. I apologize. Yeah. I I couldn't see the number. So, so now question <laughs> there we go. eight. Yes, yes, yes. I thought we were on six somehow. What did you wish you had known earlier when you were in rotations? Okay, so I can definitely speak to that one. Um, just again, having an open mind. So don't go in saying like, I want to do this specialty and like being miserable on every rotation that's not the specialty that you want to do. Um, try to go in and just say like, I can learn something from this because the truth is, you know, in your career, things are going to pop up and who knows, like something that you learn on a third year OB-GYN rotation, even though you don't want to do OB-GYN could end up saving one of your patient's lives in the future. If you're, you know, in the ER, if you're on, you know, a hospitalist, um, if you're on call for the night that something comes in. Um, so I think just being open-minded and then, you know, knowing how to study for your shelf exams, Kaplan has tons of resources. Um, we have like the Emma Holiday videos and she's amazing. People love her. So also just knowing how to study for shelf exams. That's kind of the more practical stuff I wish I knew for rotations. Great. Thank you. Uh, Anthony? Yeah. So um, just hopping off on that, um, definitely figure out what resources you use to study best for shelf exams because you are on rotation, so you'll have kind of a, a, like less time than you usually would to, to study. So knowing what really works for you is going to go a long way. Um, and Kaplan has some amazing, amazing cue banks for that. Um, so in terms of general advice for third year rotations, I have five things. Um, I call them the five Ps. There's only four Ps. And the other one, you kind of just have to imagine. Um, the first thing would be um, presentations. Um, so do Pre presentations, like mini five to 10 minute presentations on something interesting that you learn. Um, you just walk up to your chief resident or your attending and be like, hey, there was this really cool thing that we saw on this patient the other day. Um, can, do we have time like before lunch or before rounds to have me talk about it for five, 10 minutes? It really shows that you're being proactive in um, your learning. Um, the second thing, which leads me to is being proactive. So a lot of the problems that I see um, third and fourth year medical students have is that they walk up to their third or fourth year um, or, or their, their resident and they're like, hey, is there anything else I can help with? Um, which is very good. But the next step on top of that is going further, realizing that your team needs something and just saying, hey, I heard overheard that we need to get this done for this patient. And that will more likely give a positive response, I think. Um, the third thing, which is, um, I think an obvious one, but this is why we're here is patient care. So making sure that your patient's needs are met, making sure that if they look confused on rounds that could be fast, then you go back and you sit with them and you talk with them because your job as a medical student and having more time usually than the residents and the attendings is that, you know, your patients inside out, you're carrying anywhere between two to four patients versus your residents who are carrying like 10, maybe 20. So you should know your two patients really well. Um, third thing is positivity. Um, so they work a lot of hours, or sorry, that's not the third thing, that's the fourth thing. Um, positivity, so your interns, residents work a lot of hours and honestly just having somebody there to be positive and uplift the spirits of the team goes a really long way um, in the hospital setting. And lastly um, is feed, feed pack. That's the imagination that we do here um, is when you ask for feedback, which you should early and often um, make sure that you actually incorporate that feedback that you ask for, because if you just ask for feedback and then you don't put it into like your next presentation or, or your interactions, then it's just going to look like, oh, you asked for presentation just to like check it off the checklist, but you're not interacting with us. Um, but yeah, those are the, um, the five things Great. that I would probably do. 
time to great. talk. So that was a little thing. But <laughs> That's good, man. I love it. PH. PH. That's great. Dory? Well, I cannot top that. Anthony's yeah, advice be, is yeah, like the luck. best thing ever. Um, truly, as I was listening to you, Anthony, I was like, oh my goodness, that's like everything I wish I had known about third year in just one concise bit. So thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. My one thing that I wish I had known um, in addition to that is I wish I had started studying earlier. I feel like when you start your rotations the first week, you're just trying to get your feet wet and just trying to figure out exactly like how your team works, how you can contribute and like where your place is. And I feel like during that time, I should have done a better job of like easing myself into my studying and using the resources that I knew worked for me. Instead, I would often use that time to get my feet wet and get used to the rotation and then I'd study more later. And in addition with studying more closer to the shelf, you're clinical responsibilities as you spend more time on that rotation or kind of more is expected of you and you're doing more. So I kind of wish I would have even that kind of upward slope out to stress myself out less by starting earlier with like Kaplan resources and whatever else works for you at the very beginning with like just little bite-sized chunks each day and kind of continuing that. And I think that will make your life hopefully less stressful than mine was during third year. But yeah, what Anthony said is just truly amazing and oh, definitely point. agree with that. Wonderful point. Okay, so we got to be quick with these last ones. If I can, sorry, I'm having a mouse problem. All right, so real quick, a couple sentences each. Uh, Anthony, we'll start with you. Best advice or resources you want to share about choosing a specialty? You, you, you could maybe something you said earlier and you just want to reinforce, or if you have anything uh, specific that you really want to make sure everybody knows. Um, I'll try to stay away from repeating things that. I've said already, um, I think we've talked about it uh, uh, like throughout this past hour, we've talked about it a lot. Um, but one thing that I think I haven't mentioned yet is um, besides following what you're passionate about, when you're interested in a specialty, don't only look at what the resident's life is like, look at what the attending's life is like as well. Um, because Residents do work a lot of hours and does get really hard. So if you look at a specialty and you're like, oh, it looks um, like it looks like it's so much work. It looks like I'm not going to have like any any time, any life, anything like that. Looking at what the attending lifestyle is like also gives you a different perspective into what the majority of your career will be if you do pick that specialty. Um, so including all the things that we've talked about in the first eight questions, I think that's the um, that's one additional thing I would throw in. Okay, uh, Tara. Um, okay, so again, trying to avoid repeating myself, which I tend to do. Um, best advice or resources to share about choosing a specialty. Um, I think for me, again, for family, um, just using the national resources that I already talked about, but just seeing how you're doing on your rotations. You know, how do you feel? What are you truly passionate about? And checking in with yourself. Um, to keep it short, I think the most important thing that I, I, I realized, especially towards the end when it's like, okay, this is it, like I'm applying for family, um, ask yourself two questions, right? So what's your definition of success? And for me, medical school, you know, getting through medical school, being a physician is my definition of success. Um, and how much money do you need to make to, to, be, to be successful, to be happy? Um, I know a lot of people struggle when they decide that they want to do family medicine. It's kind of like the, you know, redheaded stepchild, you know, we don't make as much as specialists. Uh, we definitely do just as much work, but the salary is just not there. Um, but, you know, for me making 200, $220,000 a year, that's more than enough. And the gratification that I get in my day-to-day -day work and the difference that I can make for people, um, you know, that, that feeds into my definition of success, it feeds into who I am as a person. So I think when you're picking your specialty, you know, asking yourself those two questions and it's okay, be honest with yourself, you know, um, if you, you know, live, live to work and you want to be in the hospital on call for 80 hours a week and, you know, orthopedic surgery is your life. You want to make, you want to make that money and you want to, you know, that's all that you want in the world, then own it and apply ortho and go for it. Um, but if you're on the other side and you don't want to do that, then own that too. So it's okay. It's okay. Whatever Pretty you good. decide to do. Own it. I like it. And Dory, uh, finish up for us here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite resources that helped me choose my specialty and also learn a ton about different specialties. Um, it's a podcast called the undifferentiated medical student Tums. 
for short, um, a medical student took, uh, I know he took a year off to also make more podcasts, but essentially he interviews experts in so many different fields and he asks the same questions each time and it's all about the field, what they like, what they don't, also like personal advice for medical students. Um, he does so many niche fields that you would never have access to on third year um, and it's super informative and it helps you learn a lot about what medicine is like, uh, the frontiers in medicine, different specialties. Um, I just absolutely, I cannot say enough good things about that podcast, The Undifferentiated Medical Student. Highly recommend it. Listen to it when you're driving to work. Listen to it on your way to vacation. Like, it's the best. Like, it is a awesome. wonderful podcast. There you go. Thank you, three. Uh, hang on. I've got one more question that was submitted. We're going to address it. We know we're we're right now at the 930 mark. So just give us two or three more minutes. Um, we just wanted to share with you uh, earlier, Tara, you mentioned uh, Dr. Holiday's videos with the shelf prep. Do you want to give a quick... Uh, a quick review of this product. Um, so you can see the bullets there, but basically it's high yield, right? So everyone's panicking, right? There's tons of material, especially for internal medicine. I mean, thousands of questions, thousands of hours worth of things that you could be doing to prepare. Um, and Emma Holiday, she's really that go-to source. I recommend watching her at the beginning of studying, in the middle of studying, at the end of studying. I watch her several times. Um, they're extremely high yield. They're, I mean, she, she knows what she's doing. And also for surgery, um, same concept. So these are, especially surgery and internal med, people don't realize they're I mean, surgery has a lot of internal medicine in it. So they go very much so together. So if you can build a strong internal medicine foundation, that'll prepare you not just for shelf exams, but for boards. Boards is like 60% internal med. Um, so Emma Holiday, she'll get you there, that's for sure. So I would definitely pay attention to this. Um, ask other medical students too. I mean, everyone knows who Emma Holiday is, so. That's awesome, thank you. Also, uh, right now is a great time to sign up for your products. So whether you wanna use uh, a full a full product like on-demand course for students who, who may be um, a little bit uh, struggling, or if you want to go with the, uh, 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 sorry, the QBank integrated plan, which gives you a study plan and some helpful videos, or just a simple QBank, you can get up to 20, 30, 60% off plus an additional 30% discount with your AMA promo. Uh, so you'll need your AMA number when you register to use that promo. So just go to capitalmedical.com, use BTS20 and take your AMA membership number with you. All right, last, uh, oh, also real quick, I swear I'm gonna throw this mouse in the, <laughs> in the river. Uh, join us on, on social media. You can join us on Twitter. Um, you can find us on, uh, I can't see my screen. Uh, well, I'm showing you folks, but you guys can see it's Instagram. That's what it is. Instagram, my apologies. I think we're on Twitter too. Um, last question you guys have. Oh, goodness. Breaking down. We had one more question. I'm just going to go ahead and type it in here for our read uh, panelists. How are you guys handling the uncertainties in applying to residency this year regarding virtual interviews, uh, people taking step two, level two, not as many fourth year electives, things like that? Um, the, how, how is COVID? Uh, impacted your career? Anybody wants to jump in? I mean, I can talk about it. I'm anxious. I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I, you work really hard to get to the place that we're at and this whole match cycle is going to be, it's unprecedented. No one knows what's going on. Um, so that's why I'll say thank you everyone for joining us here. Um, Kaplan, I'm, I'm using Kaplan as a crutch. I mean, they have so many resources. They're reaching out to everyone they know, all the experts, um, you know, a lot of good advice and just that feeling, right, of like camaraderie. We're all kind of going through the same thing. Um, and so I definitely say like, use your resources. Kaplan is an amazing resource. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was, if it didn't help me get to where I am today. Um, you know, besides that, some of these program directors don't even know what they're doing. I talk to them and I'm like, hey, you know, some programs are doing virtual sub internships and they look at me like I have five heads. Like, what do you mean? What is that? So <laughs> they're all on a different page. They don't really know what's happening either. Um, you know, we're all just kind of going with the flow. Just do the best that you can. Some hospitals are taking electives, you know, basically just email as many people as you can and it's worth it. You know, I've gotten 30 rejection letters but I just set up a virtual sub internship last week. So you'll get some yeses, you'll get tons of no's. Just know that you're not alone. Know that the resources are out there. Kaplan's here to help you. Um, you know, we're all here to help you. 
Um, and we're going to get through this. But, you know, the reality is we're not going to know till March 2021 happens how it affected everyone. Right. So let's just try to enjoy the ride, do the best we can. You know, it wouldn't be medical school if they didn't throw some wrenches in it. it you know, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Just use those mantras. Try to stay positive. Hang in there, baby. Right. The kitten. <laughs> exactly yeah or the the guy that's sitting and everything's on fire and he's like this, yeah, is, yeah, fine. this is fine yeah yeah, yeah. it's and been that's my life for the last like four years so no doubt we're, we're counting on you guys and ladies so please uh anthony dory would you like to to address you know this year's madness regarding your career just kind of what tara said everyone's in the same boat um everyone's schools are handling things a little bit differently i know all of our schools probably started back at different times um i think that uh, limiting a ways is going to be hard um for students i'm really 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 happy some of my anxiety has been slightly lifted we don't have an anesthesia program at my home school and i like tara was saying got a ton of rejections because of geographical limitations and a lot of states weren't taking students. And then I did get one away. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that, but that's not something that everyone's going to be able to do this year. And I think that all of the specialty societies pretty much have come out to say that that's not something you need to do this year. So I would say that don't stress yourself out if that's something that's not gonna work out in your schedule or just something that your school isn't gonna work out with, with kind of how your school's doing things. like. It is unprecedented and residency programs are working through everything just as much as we are. So I wouldn't, I would definitely not stress yourself out and give yourself some grace if things don't go the way you want them to this year, if that makes sense. But I think we're all in the same boat and it's all gonna work out. And um, we hopefully are, they, they need doctors and sure. they're gonna need residents. So I would not, I would give yourself some grace. Exactly. Anthony, you want to finish up for us? Yeah, I mean, the amount of times that we have heard and will hear, like these are unprecedented unprecedented times or that um, all medical schools, uh, students across the country are experiencing this as well. Um, it can be really frustrating, um, but it is true. Um, we're all approaching this with like, with the same like first foot. Um, we're all, we have all never experienced something like this before. Um, we all just, um, need to do the work that we can, put the best impression of ourselves out there, reach out to as many people as possible, even if you don't know them or don't have a connection with them, um, reach out. Um, because these programs, um, they ultimately at the end of the day also want great physicians and they're going to try to do their best with whatever policies they have um, to make sure that that happens. Um, and just staying healthy and um, staying positive and um, getting through this all like actually as a nation, as a world. Um, as a medical society, so. Great, excellent, excellent. And um, what was it, uh, Tara, you said hungry, what was the second one? Hungry, humble, and kind. Hungry, humble, kind, positive, the five Ps. Uh, yeah, Midori was talking about positive attitudes. So I agree with, with all of you. They're, those are all great things to take away from tonight. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, I want to thank each one of you, Tara, Anthony, and Dory. Uh, you did a great job tonight. Uh, you're very honest and forthright with, with everybody. I hope that everybody got that impression at home. Uh, and I hope that uh, everybody here has great success and gets everything that you deserve and more. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, you know, um, you think you're on the right path. Um, please feel free contact Kaplan Medical. We've got lots of uh, smart people here to help you and answer your questions and get you on the right path. We've got great products, brand new QBank with all kinds of great uh, new features. Uh, so don't be shy. We give a lot of free products and free trials. So go to our website, try us out. I'm Mark Ratliff. Thanks everybody. Thanks to the back behind the scenes folks helping out tonight. We really appreciate your help and uh, have a great night everybody and stay safe. Good night.